Hello and welcome to today's webinar on what's hot right now. My name's Wendy McLeod and I am the Computing at School Community Outreach Manager for communities across London and the East of England. In this webinar this morning, we'll be discussing the latest apps, providing tips for teachers who are getting into computing and suggestions for staying up to date. We will also be discussing what's new from barefoot computing and computing at school. Joining me this morning, we have uh, three fantastic panelists and I'm gonna introduce them to you now. First of all, we have Matt Warren, and Matt is a computing and IT specialist who works at the Royal Grammar School in Worcester. He is a CAS master teacher and community leader, spearheading the power of community in Worcestershire. Matt was recently named in the prestigious EdTech 50 Awards as a leader of change in the UK. Also on the panel, we have Tim Wilson. Tim is a CAS community outreach manager like myself, and he manages communities of practice across the Midlands and some in the Southwest. Uh, he joined uh, Computing at School in January. And prior to that, Tim was a regional lead for Co-Club at the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, our final panelist is Neil Ricketts from Computing Champions. Um, I'm gonna let him introduce himself because he is standing in for uh, John Chip, uh, AKA Dr. Chips this morning, who was meant to be joining us, who, but unfortunately um, he's had some technical issues. Um, so Neil, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Wendy. So I'm Neil. I'm a senior lecturer in computing education at the University of Hertfordshire, and I do a couple of days a week normally for uh, the BCS through their computing at schools work, as well as lots of independent stuff, such as writing schemes of work, um, developing resources and so on and so forth. Thank you. OK, so um, we're going to be taking your questions this morning. So if you have any questions um, as we're going through, please, can you put them into the questions section and uh, we'll be bringing those um, to our panelists. So we're going to kick off with um, talking to Matt, first of all. Matt, my first question is uh, which apps would you recommend using uh, with primary children? Okay, so it's a pretty huge question, Wendy. One that I uh, I spent quite a quite a bit of time thinking about actually when we talk about apps and um, the actual impact they have. Um, the first one I, I'd like to share is it's got to be probably the most underrated app I think available. It's free. Um, you can do so much with Scratch Junior. People think it's it's just a really uh, oh it is a prelude to to Scratch, but actually there's so much in there that we can really push children to uh, to develop their skills. You can see that we've got we've got loops in there. Um, in, in terms of it being user friendly app, it is so so easy to actually you know the interface. Scratch.mit.edu on the iPad is is a little bit trickier I think for some aspects, but you can do so much on Scratch Junior. Um, so that's why it's uh, my first go to app really. Um, it's also a really nice chance for you to use broadcasting with pupils. So I always look at this as a bit of an exit point, really, for year fives and sixes in terms of their, their skills with, um, with coding, programming, um, but sending broadcast. So you've got the flag system in Scratch Junior where you can, get, um, you can get different sprites to do different things at different times. Um, and I think that's why it's really powerful with the different screens as well. So that's my first app that I'm going to share with you, Scratch Junior. Um, where am I going to go next on this journey? So in terms of sort of progression, um, Swift Playgrounds, it's another free app. It's, um, it's iPad based. It also works on MacBooks now on iOS. Um, this is great because I think as an entry, the graphics on here are just really beautiful. Um, pupils are straight away, they're, they're hooked by uh, wanting to solve these problems. You have a choice of characters that you can actually choose. Uh, and um, learn to code one. I, I've probably used it with year threes, but as a whole group, and then sort of taking on levels, I think the progression gets quite um, quite tricky 
So I'd probably aim this one at your fives and sixes in terms of that lovely little bridge really between uh, sort of the, the, the block-based coding and the text-based coding because Swift is its own coding language. Um, and once you've mastered the skills in Learn to Code 1, the progression is pretty simple. There's teacher guides that go with this. Um, you can move on to Learn to Code 2. Uh, and then there are so many different things that you can actually download um, as add-ons for Swift Playgrounds that just make this a really, really versatile app as well. So number two is Swift Playgrounds. Um, third one that I've got for you um, is something called AR Maker. Now, augmented reality has been has been quite popular in the last few months, and AR Maker has been around for a little while. Um, as you can see on the screen, so what is it? Well, basically, it ena enables you to to produce things. You can make things, let's say, on the iPad in in an app called Keynote. So simple pictures, text, but then you can place them in the real world. And then looking through the iPad, you have this augmented world. Um, this was a little project I did recently with some year six pupils where we took computers apart uh, and we looked at all the components, all the hardware. Um, and then what I got them to do is to actually, for me, it's about the pupils teaching someone else. If they can teach a concept, I know that they've really grasped it. And it's that top, I don't know if you've ever seen the graphic, of that pyramid um, of ways that we learn, but that top percentile is about teaching other people and I've used AR Maker pretty successfully with pupils then teaching me um, about how certain components work uh, and then placing them in in the real world so uh, yeah that's my three I think I had a final one for you um, this is from um, Brie Bass so this is um, Perfect Day I've used this um, probably year fives and sixes it's just really really nice warm-ups these are all computational thinking. There's probably about 100 different problems on here. Um, and I often use this in the afternoons with, with, with groups um, as an alternative to a bit of guided reading one day. But we'll have a little look at this as these, um, these, these really cool problems to get pupils to actually uh, look into, apply computational thinking and logic, uh, and to develop their skills. And I think I just put one bonus for you here, Wendy which was um, Sphero EDU. Um, so again, another free app. Um, this one is, is to do with the Sphero robots. So if there's anyone out there looking for a tool to use, the app is really nice. It links very, very, very closely with Scratch, um, but, but it's, um, it's great for sort of breaking off, off screens and actually kinesthetically coding with robots. So they are my, my choice of apps, Wendy. That's brilliant, thank you. Um... And the second question is, uh, what are your top tips for teachers who are just getting into computing? Okay, it's a great question. Um, and I think in, in sort of, I suppose I've been teaching computing since 2013 when Michael Gove announced this as part of the curriculum. Um, for, me, for me, this was my way in, launch a code club. And I, we have Tim on the panel who, who obviously used to sort of um, spearhead the code club movement in the UK. Um, for me, this, this was two things. It was about me developing my own skills with the progressive projects that you have with the Code Club projects. Um, and also creating a bit of a safe space, really, Wendy, to, to take some risks, to learn with the, with the pupils, uh, and to actually really start developing skills to then apply back in the curriculum. So my, my first tip would be launch a Code Club. It's free, it's the easiest thing to do. And for me, this has had the most impact, I think, on my practice. My second top tip um, is got to be flip the classroom. Computing is an incredible subject, um, but I think we've got to move away from the idea that the teacher knows everything. In, in this modern day, we've, we've got so many people who are actually so clued up and enjoy computing, they enjoy coding. It's so much more accessible. And I think when you actually start to, to take a step back in lessons, um, you can see from the two images here, we've got um, in the bottom left, I've got um, a girl who I just worked with in that lesson, the teacher we were working on Swift. I taught her something that she was a little bit confused with to do with functions. Um, and then five minutes later, I had about another five or six pupils also stuck on that problem. Um, and straight away, I said, okay, do you want to link up to the board? You take over. If you're stuck on this one, um, go to the front um, and go and see uh, this young lady because she'll teach you exactly what she knows. 
So I think it's really, really important to take a step back and um, put, put the whole focus on pupils. Um, they, they will help you drive this forward. And my final final tip then is, is about failure. It, it's about, I, I think, just, just enabling pupils to, to, to actually fail in lessons and saying that that's okay. I will start lessons so many times with, I, I want you to fail at least 20 times today. So I can see that you are really putting some effort in um, and actually celebrating failures, bringing them up, up on the board, looking at more efficient ways we could have done it uh, and actually bringing the class on board with, we can see failures as being effort because there's never one right answer for computing for programming. Um, but in terms of effort, that's what you want to see from your pupils. You want them thinking outside the box. Um, so they would be my three tips for, for anyone really looking to progress their skills in computing. Yeah, some good tips there. Thank you. Um, I really like the idea of using uh, pupils up the front and teaching the rest of the class and, and demonstrating their own skills um, and empowering them in coding sessions. That's a, that's a fantastic idea for um, for teachers and also to know that that's okay you know we don't have all the answers and um, use the children in the class that are particularly confident um, to teach the others so that's some fantastic tips thank you um final question um when i advertised this webinar i mentioned the fact that um according to the app store and google play store that there are on average six thousand apps uploaded um new apps available every day um and so I wonder if you could give some advice to teachers about how to stay up to date with the latest educational software. Um, what, how would you recommend that uh, teachers listening to this webinar go about doing that? OK, well, I think I'll, I'll, I'll put this into two parts, if that's OK, Wendy. I think the first one is if, if you're not a member of sort of CAS, I think the CAS community is something that it's a movement that is really thriving. In terms of my professional development, um, this was probably the one thing that enabled me to really, really um, to push on and to to network. Um, and one of the first things I did was uh, having a huge interest in computing, uh, but not really having the expertise. As I, I went on to do the um, the CAS Master Teacher course, and then moving to the grammar school, I launched the CAS Hub. Um, and now the hub really for me was about being in a school and not being isolated so obviously with our CAS meetings our community meetings that's when we do share really good practice um, and as a community leader I want to go into those meetings and I want to learn as much from other people as that I can, I can actually potentially offer the community so my first tip has to be CAS it links with the second part to this question um, because I think the real point in my career Wendy where I started to to network and just learn so much from global educators was setting up educational Twitter account. Um, this really was the one thing that enabled me to sort of propel my my pedagogy um, and what's out there. I mean, I recently did a, uh, a a post on Twitter to actually ask people what they felt the benefits of being on Twitter were. Uh, and I'm more than happy I'll share this with you Wendy because um, I've shared it as a wakelet so if there's anyone out there who needs convincing um, I will share a link which basically will Twitter as a personal learning network uh, and I look at this now and I used to have my personal learning network used to be no bigger than the staff room in my school um, through different activities through cows through through Apple um, I've developed a network that is now worldwide and so when I'm after some advice, I've just got a huge number of people I can actually call on, I can talk to and communicate. Um, so for me, that is my go to. Uh, and as I said, I'll share the link out because it's um, it's really, really interesting. Yeah, thanks for mentioning Twitter, um, because we do have our CAS chat. Um, on a Tuesday evening from eight o'clock, and that's another opportunity um, to engage, as you've mentioned, with that wider community of professionals um, and to, to find out what other teachers and um, computer leads are doing in their areas. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, we have a comment in the question box about Sphero Play from Joe. I just wondered if you've used that app and uh, if you have, if there's anything that you wanted to mention about that. 
okay, so Sphero Play um, is really nice stuff. For me, Sphero Play will, will probably show you what the Spheros are capable of doing. Um, because what you've got on these on these robots is you've got um, you've got gyroscopes. So um, basically, Sphero Play will enable you to play games with the Sphero by rotating it, by moving it, uh, and that will link to to little games on the screen. So I think that's really it's a really nice place to start in terms of teaching the actual fundamentals of what 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 this robot can do. It's almost the same controls as a helicopter. Um, so I think that that's a really lovely tool. But then the Sphero EDU is that that's where you use your block based, your text based coding. Um, that's where it really, really comes to comes to life. So I think that's probably the difference, really. OK, thank you. For that. Thank you for mentioning Scratch Junior at the start. And um, when I was leading uh, computing in uh, Caterham, where I live, um, we use Scratch Junior for Key Stage 1. We also use an app that's not widely known. Um, it is a free app. And it's called The Foos, and that's F-O-O-S. And this is a fantastic app um, which can be used in the early years. So for, I can recommend it. You can use it with um, nursery and reception children. And um, it's a great way of introducing young children to block-based coding. Um, and it starts uh, with the child just dragging um, one block um, onto the screen and getting the character to, to do one step forward. And then press the star and it's just a very simple um app and uh, they can use it independently and they can pro progress through the levels and um, so that's my top tip but it's a nice transition from the foos to scratch unit and then into scratch in key stage two okay thank you and um, we're going to move on to neil now i'm so pleased that neil um agreed to support this webinar um because uh he's now able to answer the questions about barefoot um, and because um, he has been involved in Dr. Chip's Daily Dose, um, he's, he's a great person to answer the questions that I have. So thank you again, Neil, for stepping in at the last minute. So the first question okay. is, um, what is Dr. Chip's Daily Dose and who is it aimed at? Okay, so thanks, Wendy. So hopefully you can see the Dr. Chip's Daily Dose website on my screen, and it's aimed uh, predominantly at Key Stage 2 children that are based um, at home at the moment, which uh, the majority of our children of primary school aged are. And for three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, it gives them a load of activities to undertake at home as well but a lot of them are suitable for key stage one and also for key stage three as well so the activities on there can be quite easily differentiated every tuesday we have computational thinking at tuesdays if i um, scroll down uh, a little bit you can see what's happening this week so uh, that's an association with barefoot today we've got crystal flowers in scratch so making some beautiful creations there and then on the wednesdays we have wonder wednesdays which is in association with the great science share and then the thursday session uh, it always have some tinkering and that relates to uh, john's uh, school Crum uh, crumpsall lane uh, primary school there What's really nice is the activities um, and the video that John shares, it's always recorded. So you can go back and look at it. And occasionally that's from other people than John. So I've done some sessions for him. There's have some cybersecurity experts on there, for example. So lots and lots of ways children can learn about uh, a range of topics. We've seen that John in his shorts doing some star jumps at one point, which was a, a sight to behold. So there's always lots of fun stuff uh, going on. Um, it's all free and uh, I say three days a week, always at 10 a.m. I'm just um, responding to a question from Susan. Um, just going back to when we were talking about the Spheros earlier, she was asking uh, whether they're expensive, Matt. So if you could just answer that question, we'll just. Uh... Okay, that, that, they've, they've got quite a few different robots out now. The app is obviously free. Uh, all the apps are free. Um, I think if you're quite savvy, you can probably get a pretty good deal. Um, you, you've got some, some different robots. The Sphero Mini, I think that's coming in. I think it's between the, the 60 to 80 pound mark. 
Um, and then yeah, probably sorry, sorry from jump in, Matt. Um, the Sphero Minis are actually uh, down to forty nine ninety nine now, so oh, come right. down again. Okay. Oh, that's really good. And I think I think there's there, there's often some really good deals. Um, the Sphero Oli has been out quite a while. It's still a fantastic robot, but you can often uh, you can get some good deals actually if you keep keep your eye out. So. Uh, Thank you. Um, Dan's asking a question about advice for schools that have limited resources. Um, so this leads, he's saying, what if we just have a few old um, Chromebooks shared between classes, we don't have any robots or iPads or other tech. Well, you come to the right place, Dan, because um, the next question that I have for Neil is about the barefoot computing and the barefoot website. Um, and everything that's on there is free. Um, and my question uh, was, could you um, bring our listeners up to date with what's new on the Barefoot Computing website? Because obviously there's been a lot of changes since the lockdown, um, especially with uh, children learning from home. So I don't know if you could just give a general, um, in, some general information about what Barefoot is as well, if there are people who are listening who haven't used it before. Yes, yeah, certainly. So if you're not aware, Barefoot provides free resources and workshops for primary schools and at both Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. It's mapped to uh, English, Scottish, Irish and Welsh curriculums as well. So there's stuff on there that will enable your children to learn about computational thinking and developing programmes. On my screen now, the bit that's just been developed over the past uh, few weeks is this at home section. And there's three parts to that. If I um, scroll down, it's aimed at parents and we've got some nice videos to explain what this computational thinking stuff is. And then a number of learning together activities. And for each one, it tells you what age it's suitable for, the kind of thing you're going to learn. And then there's activity instructions, a little bit like a lesson plan, as well as supporting worksheets. And for some of those, it, they're really nice physical activities. Children can be jumping around, hand jiving, dancing, and so on and so forth. Some of them are quite creative and arty as well. And there's activities there from age four up to age 11, though again, I think certainly some of them be suitable for key stage three. There's also a number of mini missions. These are a shorter activities kind of thing perhaps you might undertake on a rainy afternoon rather than maybe basing an entire lesson around, but they allow children to really practice some of those skills that they've perhaps developed when programming at a machine or in some of the earlier activities. And the final thing which uh, children really enjoy are these interactive learning games. So they can develop their knowledge and understanding of some of these computational thinking concepts, such as uh, pattern spotting, decomposition, abstraction, all that fun stuff on the screen, blasting asteroids, doing a bit of code breaking, looking at aliens and uh, so on and so forth. And they can be undertaken independently as well, which is uh, really nice. So uh, the parent can uh, get on with um, those fun household jobs, for example, which always uh, stuck out when the kids are around. Yeah, I can second that. I can definitely recommend the interactive games. Uh, my daughter was playing um, on the Barefoot Zoo yesterday and she was, she was loving it. So, um, yeah, highly recommend those. Um, let's go to the next question. So what do you think is the best way for teachers to raise awareness of these new materials? Would you recommend um, sending out the link to the website or would it be, could they set some of these activities for the children to do at home or what, what do you think is the best yeah, way? Yeah, certainly. I think probably a, a range of approaches are required depending on how you normally uh, communicate with your children but if they the school's using a tool such as Google Classroom it might be a link uh, to one of the activities uh, directly is put on there perhaps they might be have one interactive learning game each week that's uh, recommended or it, it could be it forms part of a suite of more general sort of creative activities that uh, children uh, are made aware of perhaps I know I'm um, quite a few teachers talk to including my daughter's school uh, it set the English and maths and that's sort of quite rigid still but topic based activities and other subjects they, they give us a range of things to choose from and I know for some children certainly they can undertake 
uh, these kind of tasks, uh, they'll be uh, really engaged. And my final question is uh, regarding the workshops that Bertha offers. Um, mm. They have a new work a new workshop, sorry, out at the moment, and um, to do with programming, um, focusing on Scratch, and um, it's called Over the Hump, and it's related to um, some camel scratch related activities it's it's really fun and it's a free uh, workshop that teachers can access but um we know that the workshops were um face to face um because they're run by volunteers uh are these workshops still available um during this period of lockdown and if people are interested in signing up to them uh, what's the best way to do that um yeah be pleased to know uh, you won't get the hump because uh, they are um, you can sign up for them and they're taking place online which is great. Uh, if you look on the Computing at School website events page you'll uh, find lots of community leaders and Barefoot Ambassadors running them and also on the Barefoot uh, site if you click on workshops uh, there it enables you to um, request one actually face to face once uh, we are back in school whatever uh, that may look like in the future. Brilliant, thank you. We've just got one question about um, this section, Neil, and it's a question from Dan, and it's about uh, Dr. Chips's lesson at 10 a.m. He asks, uh, do you have to do uh, the Dr. Chip lesson live at 10, or are they recorded? Um, yes, not at all. They, it can be done at any time, and if you want to watch it live as it's, it comes out at 10 a.m., that's fine, but they are recorded, and in some ways actually watching it afterwards is better because any um, mistakes that obviously John would never make any mistakes like uh, being able to log on to a webinar but any mistakes that he, he might make any resources he might share incorrectly uh, he will rectify them so a bit later in the day that uh, they'll be perfect rather than just very good thank you okay uh, we're going to go to Tim now um, and uh, find out uh, the new what's new at computing at school so my first question is, uh, there's been many changes to the ways that we've been working uh, since the lockdown. Can you bring us up to date with the main changes at computing at school? I'm just going yes, to make you a presenter so you can share your screen. Thank you very much. Cool. Um, first of all, thank you uh, very much for inviting me today, Wendy, and hello to everyone. Um, so um, I'm sure many of you who are joining us today are familiar with computing at schools. Um, for those of you who aren't, um, computing at school is a, a long-standing um, nationwide network of communities of practice uh, led by teachers and some and educators for teachers and educators. Um, what we do is provide um, a space um, virtually and online increasingly over the last few weeks um, and traditionally face to face as well uh, for teachers to meet, gather, share resources, hear from great speakers, hear from teachers and also ask questions and be inquisitive and find out more about how they can improve their practice or, or as computing teachers, how they can um, improve things at their schools. Um, it's a I'm using a phrase that Matt used earlier, it's a safe space, he used it in relation to Coca Club, I'm using it in relation to CAS, but it is a safe space for teachers wherever they are on their journeys to meet and exchange and come out with new ideas, much like these meetings. Um, and of course um, we have we have over 200, um, over 225 communities um, across the country um, and um, Wendy and myself are um, part of a team of community outreach managers who, organize, who manage and uh, support community leaders in running communities of practice. Um, Matt today, for example, is a community leader um, for Worcester Primary uh, Community. But since lockdown, uh, online has become very much, uh, to use a phrase that's overused, the new normal. Um, and what's really happened, and this has really been amazing for, what's well, been amazing, just full stop, um, is that we've seen community leaders um, responding to the needs of teachers. Uh, we've been uh, listening a lot in our forums, on our brand new Facebook pages, 
um, been listening to community leaders and responding by running meetings that deal with a whole host of different subject areas and needs. Um, and also because of the space that we're in right now, obviously that space is changing, um, we're finding that teachers are finding the time to develop their CPD and develop their skills. So the kinds of um, topics that you see on the slide here are indicative of the kinds of things that have been run by community leaders up and down the country. And the beautiful thing about running meetings online is it doesn't matter where you're from. Uh, geography, the, the, the barriers the geography have have been broken down completely and we're finding that people are coming to join meetings no matter who, where the community leader or where, wherever the speakers are. The other beautiful thing that we've had uh, with CAS meetings is that we're able to have uh, people joining us and contributing to meetings from across the country. So you may be hosting a meeting in Yeovil, but someone from Newcastle can be a speaker at that meeting. Um, and we're finding that it's broke. What it's what it was also done is it meant as a community we're able to come together much more and exchange ideas and exchange and discuss. So typically. Um, over the first few weeks of lockdown, a lot of our meetings were about um, resources. Um, so there were a lot of meetings around Seesaw, Google Classroom, Teams, uh, Purple Mash, uh, all sorts of resources. Um, and we've, um, these have continued to be popular. Um, we've also had meetings around Scratch. Um, Richard Smith, who is based in Telford, um, has been running Scratch workshops and they've been extremely well attended. Um, We've had a lot of um, a lot of uh, work around uh, curriculum planning, all the way from Key Stage One through to A level. So we're, over the last couple of weeks, in particular, we've been seeing a lot of meetings around schemes of work, around transition, um, around GCSE changes to the OCR. So Keredig from OCR has been coming to a lot of. Uh, uh, community meetings. I think we had a meeting yesterday in Wolverhampton which had over 70 people coming to hear from Keredig uh, about the changes to OCR, um, the OCR uh, GCSE. And then um, a lot of stuff around NCCE. So um, a lot of our community leaders are also um, NCCE facilitators and subject matter experts um, on the on the NCCE. So we're being a lot of tasters introductions to the kind of programs that they're doing because the NCCE have moved everything online as well. So um, again, all those geographical barriers are broken down. And then um, just to uh, tap into what Neil's been saying, we're running a lot of stuff on uh, introductions and tasters on Barefoot as well. Um, and we're seeing a lot of barefoot facilitators who are also community leaders running taster sessions. Uh, the great thing is we're very much responding to what's what you need as teachers. So um, one of the things that we're very keen to do is to hear from you. We have a community forum on our website, but we also have our brand new Facebook pages for primary and secondary teachers. So if, you, if there are things that we haven't covered, there are things that we're missing, this is this is part of being a community. We want to hear from you. So we want to stay on top of what's hot right now. Um, so, yeah, that's that's basically what we've been doing at CAS. So, yeah, thank you. I'm, yes. I'm glad you mentioned about the uh, CAS Facebook pages because we have a question from Sarah saying, what's the best way to find upcoming meetings that CAS are running? Um, and sometimes she finds it a struggle to find the information that she needs on the website. So thank you um, for asking that question um, and also for mentioning um, the CAS Facebook page. And as, as we mention, it appears on the screen. Thank you. Uh, so this is our new uh, primary community uh, group that was set up a few weeks ago. Um, so please can I encourage you to, to sign up to that. Um, we're putting quite a lot of information about our meetings on there. Um, also, look specifically at the CAS community events page um, uh, to see all the events. And as Tim said, you know, we don't have the, the barriers of um, distance and geography anymore, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, so you can attend uh, any of the meetings for free that are, that are advertised CAS community meetings on there. Um, we have eight minutes left, so moving swiftly on. Um, if, could you briefly tell us what CAS Inspire is? This is something that's new for this summer and uh, what the people watching this webinar should be looking out for. Yes, absolutely. So um, again, very much in response to um, 
the changing climate. I'm trying to, very desperately to avoid cliches. Um, we have launched a brand new program called Kaz Inspire. We're using the hashtag Kaz Inspire 20. So um, what this is, is a, a suite of um, webinars of which this uh, webinar today is part of Kaz Inspire 20. So webinars, podcasts, um, we've got some um, really interesting and fun um, videos that are coming up. Um, we're having, um, we're, we're developing resources that are aimed at um, teachers to pass on to parents and kids that have, um, we're doing some stuff around camouflaged learning. I'm trying not to spoil what's coming. Um, and we're doing a lot of stuff around home learning um, to support uh, teachers in providing resources for um, parents and kids as well. Um, in terms of webinars, um, one that's uh, the next, for example, the next web webinar that Wendy is hosting in a couple of weeks is a really important one. And it's on digital parenting. So um, very much how we advise parents on online safety. Um, and we've got some really great guests coming uh, as part of that. So what we're trying to do is continue to continue to inspire you and, ins and inspire um, and be on top of what teachers are, are needing and what parents are needing as well. So, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And um, if you could just quickly talk us through what's new on the CAS website and um, what's new from other partner or organisations. Yes, so I put a slide up, but as I can show you, show you directly, I'll do that. Um, so again, um, it's very much reflective, I think, of a lot of our, what we're doing and what a lot of our partner organisations are doing. We're very, very mindful of uh, providing um, signposting teachers to what's hot and what's out there. So as you know, as a community of teachers, the, we developed this um, home learning section on our website. So when you go onto our homepage, home learning will be up the top. And um, what's really good about this, um, this section on our website is it very much provides um, links, a glossary of, of what's good, good and what's out there. Um, in terms of activities for um, to be to be done at home, so uh, fancy that barefoot and doctor chip um, coming up here, but it it links through to a lot of a lot of what's cool and what's out there, um, and it's a great first 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 port of call for when you're looking for um, home learning resources. So we're not just talking about learning activities, but also um, things around connecting with others. Um, so we got some advice about um, which which uh, particular uh, chat platforms? Sorry, uh, chat platforms are um, how to get going on that. Um, and we've also got uh, a, a whole section on online safety. Um, there's there's as I say there's there's lots of really really good, really good resources there. Um, on top of that, um, um, a little signpost to what some of our partner organisations, um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, um, they're always hot on this anyway because it's the nature of what they do in terms of their mission. Um, but they have pretty much brought together their their various hats, Code Club, Code Dojo, etc., and developed um, home learning. But basically, the whole Learn platform is all about learning at home right now. And they are basically opening up all of their projects, including their code projects, including their you know their young. They got a whole cool young make, uh, makers. Um, Makers showcase called Coolest Projects, which was face to face, and they're moving it online. This is um, a great platform for kids who are makers and giving them the opportunity to share what they're doing and share their ideas. And um, you know, they're also signposting a lot to the NCCE, of which they are, and we are a partner. And talking of the NCCE, um, they've also developed a lot of uh, resources for home teaching. They're doing weekly bulletins right now, which provide a sort of snapshot of things that um, you can provide for parents and, te uh, and things you can deliver and online and home in a home learning environment. So there's a lot of really, really extensive and cool stuff out there right now. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for that whistle stop tour. Um, we've just got a couple of questions that we can get to to, to close. Um, Louise's question was about what age is Mr. Chips aimed at? Um, I would say primary. Um, yeah, there's quite... always key stage two and normally key stage one on there, but sometimes there's stuff that uh, would be suitable for some key stage three children um, as well. I, I just picked out one other thing out the cupboard as well, just to show the difference on these two. So this is a normal Sphero and this Thank is you. a Sphero Mini, so this is a 50 quid one. 
and then he's um yeah i think that is it 90 or so you think you said matt i think probably you've got the sparks i think you could probably get for about 80 maybe possibly maybe yeah. cheaper uh and the, the ollies yeah, i think you could probably get even cheaper than that there yeah there's options, certainly lots there. on ebay as well um and we've got one final question for matt from dan he asks, is an educational Twitter account different from a regular one, or do you just mean joining EdTech Twitter chats? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, when I sort of started this journey, I didn't quite, quite know what sort of angle to go from um, with Twitter. It's a bit of a minefield. I think you've got to go in with a bit of a game plan. Uh, I've now got two Twitter accounts. I have one for sort of social use, uh, where I follow maybe Worcester Warriors and things like that. Um, and then one purely for education where i do get involved in the cas chat uh the apple community chat um you know some really really good things going on there so i think going with the game plan if you're going to use this and get something out of it then you know the community is about sharing things uh, and then also asking questions so it's a bit of give and take really um so by all means you know that there's people in this on on this panel definitely worth a follow have a little look at who who they're actually following some of the links they're making um, and you will soon start to get a bit of traction. Um, join in the CAS chat as well. That's really, really good on uh, that's every Tuesday evening, eight or nine. Um, and you'll start to develop your own personal learning network. Uh, I'd love to share that link, Wendy, at some point with the delegates uh, in, in terms of, you know, some top tips and what people get out of this and also some good people to share. That's OK. Yeah, certainly. And um, we're just going to finish by um, drawing your attention to a couple of events uh, that are coming up. If you are a primary computing lead or a primary teacher and you're interested in uh, how to prepare for an Ofsted deep dive, and also um, if you're interested in, in learning a bit more about how to use Google Classroom, then I just want to draw your attention to a community meeting that's happening at 4.30 this afternoon. So please sign up to that on the CAS website if you're interested. Um, and as Tim already mentioned, uh, the next primary uh, focused webinar that we're going to be bringing you um, is in two weeks time on the 28th of May. And I'm really delighted to announce that we have um, guests from the Breck Foundation and Theop who are going to be uh, answering questions about digital parenting. So a fantastic panel there. So please um, join us for that. And also uh, let other people know through your social media channels um, about that webinar. And indeed any other CAS events um, that you feel your colleagues will be interested in. Um, and there's nothing else really to say that apart from thank you so much to everyone who's joined our webinar this morning. Uh, special thanks to Matt, um, to Tim and to Neil. And we look forward to seeing you at a future event uh, from, brought to you from Computing at School. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>